Welcome to Living a Graceful Life. I'm Denise Medved, your host. I'm also the creator and founder of Ageless Grace Brain Health. And I hope you'll comfortable while you're watching this because we're here to remind you that it's never too late to begin making choices to create the life that you want to live. So I hope you'll sit back, find a comfortable spot, maybe get yourself a cup of tea, maybe have a cat or a dog nearby and really relax and enjoy yourself. That's the first choice I'd like you to make for a more graceful life. I'm gonna make the same choice and sit back here in my chair next to the fireplace and make myself comfortable. So tonight's episode is going to be talking about better brain, better life. We talked about the fact that having a graceful life has many components. There's the physical component and the physical component means the body and it also means the brain. It means the mind, which is something other than the brain. It's about awareness and consciousness like this little creature right here. So there's also the emotional aspect as well as the mental aspect of being a human in a body on this planet and choosing to make decisions and choices for yourself that would give you the life you truly want. There's the spiritual aspect or the spirit aspect and they're similar, but they're actually very different. One is the spirit, it is your thumbprint. It is who you are. It's your spirit. But then there's also the spiritual aspect of being a human. And that is about believing in something that's bigger than yourself, that's greater, that's other than just the physical body, that is maybe the true you. And so all of those things make up the choices that we need to make in order to choose to have a graceful life. We talked about the body last week, physically, the body, talking about that we always hear that the body needs diet and exercise. Well, we changed those words last week to nourishment and movement. Things that are user-friendly, things that we can all do, regardless of our age, our geographic location, our physical abilities, all of those things have to do with choices that we make that can make our life quality better, that can make our functionality better. So tonight we're gonna to focus on the brain itself, which of course is part of the body. The first thing I'd like to tell you that you may already know is that the purpose of the brain is to control movement of the body. It's not just to create something wonderful or to use your imagination or to do a calculation or create a retirement plan. It's there to control every move that you make and every breath that you take. So when we move the way I'm moving right now, using my arms and hands, using my facial muscles, all of those things require the brain to tell my body parts what to do. So obviously, if my brain is functioning well, if it's giving messages really quickly, if it's receiving information really quickly, then it's able to cause my body to have a better life. If I can respond, react, and recover to everything that I want to do and everything that I need to do, then my life will have a better quality. So there are things that we need to do. I would say probably walking, talking, eating, sleeping, those things are we need to do to keep the body alive and to keep the brain alive. The brain actually needs three things. It needs oxygen, it needs sleep, and it needs water. And those are just the things to keep it alive. So what can we do about those things? Well, first of all, exhaling, paying attention to the exhale is really important because obviously if you're here, 
listening to this, you're breathing, but you're probably breathing in. And if I were to say to you, take a breath, you would probably go, as opposed to, and I would like all of you to just exhale with me right now. There's a relaxation in the release, the letting go of the breath that's really critical to our brain health as well as our physical body health. Oxygen is needed in every cell to stay alive, not just the brain. So if you focus on humming, whistling, singing, repeating phrases, tongue twisters, talking out loud, all of those types of things are actually an exhale because that means in order to exhale, you have to be pushing the air out with sound or pushing the sound out with the abdominal wall. So pay attention to your exhale when you're breathing and not so much the inhale. If you feel tense, if you feel anxious, we all know take a deep breath. Well, don't take a deep breath. Let a deep breath go. Instead of going, just go. So the next thing we need for the brain to be alive is water. Now, a lot of people say to me, I don't like water. It, it doesn't taste like anything or it tastes badly because the chemicals and things in it. Well, you can certainly buy bottled water, but there are all kinds of little drops uh, that you can put in now that have probably your favorite flavor. So you could have grape tasting water or tangerine tasting water. So look for some of those little drops in your local market and you might be surprised how you can make water more delicious. Now, the best thing to do is carry a water bottle around with you all day long. Put it in your car, put it beside your desk, put one beside your bed at night. The more water bottles you have, the more likely you are to drink. You could even set your smartphone or your smart watch to go off at a certain time and say, oh, it's time to take a drink. And there are also lots of apps that say it's time to move now or it's time to take a drink of water now. So remind yourself to drink, to be hydrated. Not only is it good for your brain, but it's also good for your skin and it's good for your overall quality of life, your digestion. Many, many things depend on water. We're mostly made up of water. And so when we use that water up through tears, through dehydration, through crying, through perspiration, then we need to replenish that water. And that happens fairly frequently. You might be surprised how often it's good for you to drink and how much better you feel if you do. And then there's sleep. So one of the things about sleep for the brain is that we need to prepare the brain. We need to get it ready. The brain is wonderful at signals, at rituals, at uh, timing of the day. So an hour before you would like to go to sleep. Don't just let it happen automatically. Don't say, oh gosh, I've been up a really long time or I'm working on a project and gosh, it's almost midnight. Set a time when you would like to go to sleep in order to have enough sleep. And everyone's a little different. Everyone doesn't need eight hours. Some need more, some need less. You know your own body or you'll learn about your own body. But an hour before you want to go to sleep, begin to shut everything down so that you're giving a signal to your brain that, oh, it's time to start getting ready to sleep because the brain is in charge of that sleep. So one of the things that I do personally is I get off of all screens. It's time to stop watching TV, texting, being on Facebook, doing work on my computer. Even though I don't want to stop, even though I'm in the middle of something, I say it's time to let everything go to sleep. Not just me, but everything that is technology. The other thing I do is I make myself a cup of tea. Now, this is not my nighttime tea. Uh, this is my living a graceful life tea. But I make myself a cup of tea and I make that making of the tea an actual ritual that's telling my brain, oh, time to stop, time to slow down. Here comes the nighttime tea. And of course, Use a tea that's an herbal tea or even a tea like sleepy time or chamomile. So you want to do something that is telling your brain, 
I recognize what this is. And what this is, is a preparation for sleep. Maybe you want to do something like turn back your bed or put the throw pillows on a chair or a chaise lounge. Maybe you want to pick up your cat and carry it uh, to the bedroom because the cat likes to sleep in that bedroom. So whatever it is, see if you can make that a ritual that you do each night to get your brain in the mood, in the mode of winding down and going to sleep. You might want to read, but I suggest that you don't read something stimulating. Don't read a mystery. Don't read an intriguing, exciting book. Read something calm and peaceful, maybe some poetry, maybe uh, a book of meditations, something quiet and peaceful that, again, is letting you know, uh, body, it's okay. You've done a great job today. That's another thing you can do is you can say gratitude to your body. Thanks for all the things you had me do. You might even want to review what those are. Thanks for the class I got to attend or teach today. Thanks for the person I got to interact with today. And go through your day very calmly and quietly and appreciatively with gratitude to let yourself be prepared to sleep and let your brain know that that's what it's time to do. So now we've created those, the ambiance for a brain to live. I'm not talking about thrive. I'm talking about just be alive, sleep, water, and oxygen. What else does the brain need to be sharper, to be more focused, to have more attention, to respond more quickly? Well, there are five primary functions of the brain. And the brain is doing those things constantly, sometimes simultaneously, some sequentially, but it's always doing those things. And there's an acronym that'll help you remember what those five functions are. The acronym is S-M-A-C-K. Smack, crackle, pop, snap. Those are the sounds of neurons firing. And neurons are, in fact, brain cells. So what we want to do is fire as many as possible in order for our brain to stay highly functional, for it to change and become better and stronger and quicker and sharper. So how do we do that? We do that by stimulating these five functions primarily through physical movement. And then what that does is it creates a state of neuroplasticity, the ability of the brain to actually change itself and the whole central nervous system, the spinal cord, all of those nerve endings, 7,000 in each hand, 7,000 in each foot. And you notice I got really comfortable. I'm in my socks. I'm, I don't want to have my shoes on when I'm at home. I want to relax. So I'm stimulating that nervous system specifically through movement. And we've already clarified that movement is not necessarily exercise. It's the body moving in a natural way, maybe even a fun way, maybe a nourishing way. So what happens when you stimulate those brain functions? Well, first, the S stands for strategic planning. And again, I'm talking about physical. So literally, it's how do I get from point A to B to C? So if I wanted to stand up, or if I wanted to get down on the floor with Bo, my big orange man coon cat, how would I do that? Well, my brain would start calculating, scoot forward, push up off the chair, put one step foot and step in front of the other, touch, reach down, whatever it might say is strategic planning, getting from one place to another in the body. Now, the next one is memory and recall. So memory, we all say, oh, I'd like a better memory. I'm starting to forget where my keys are or, oh, I'm worried that I'm going to lose my recall of many things I know like my mother or my grandmother did. Well, memory is actually a physical experience, believe it or not. It's not just a brain function. It's a physical function of remembering where you were when you heard something, uh, where you were when someone had a conversation with you and where you were looking in that person's eyes or sitting across the table, a memory of hearing a sound like a musical instrument or the crack of a bat against the baseball. It is a physical experience that you are remembering with your brain. Now, 
Recall is a little different than memory because recall is recalling what you know about something. I love to use the example of a trombone. I've never held a trombone. I've never played a trombone, but I've seen people do it in orchestras and bands. I've watched it on TV. So if I said to myself, hmm, how would I play a trombone? Right away, I'm recalling what I know about the trombone and the slide on it. So that's memory and recall. Analytical thinking, it's about all the parts and components that make up a movement or an activity. So if I were to say, gee, I'm going to play the game of basketball, then I might say, oh, I might dribble the ball. I might run down the court. Um, hopefully if I've got the ball, I'm running and dribbling at the same time. I might pass it off to someone. I might shoot into the basket hoop. All of those are analytical thinking, reminding myself of what are all the parts and components of this movement or activity I want to do. Then there's creativity and imagination. And many of us think, oh, like that's being an artist or a musician. Well, those things are creative and they do use imagination. But creativity from a physical point of view and a brain point of view actually means doing something differently than you've done before. So literally, if I were brushing my teeth with this hand and I decided to brush it with this hand, I would be creative. My brain would be saying, oh, that's different. Let me fire some neurons uh, so that we can learn something new or do something that we already know how to do differently. And that's literally creativity. Imagination is literally seeing an image in your mind. And you do that more than you realize. We almost always see an image of ourselves some, doing something at least right before we do it. So if I'm going to simply walk out the front door and go into my car, I'm already imagining in my mind, walking down those steps and getting into the car and seeing it and seeing myself open the car door. Certainly, if I'm about to do something new, I'm imagining how I'm going to do that. I'm seeing a picture of me uh, playing the trombone. I'm seeing that in my mind or I'm seeing a picture of someone else doing it so that I can imitate it. So creative and imagination. And Interestingly enough, Dr. Norman Doidge, who wrote the book, The Brain That Changes Itself, did MRIs and said that they have proven now that imagination, seeing it in your mind, and action or physical activity light up almost all the same parts of the brain. How fabulous is that? So when we actually act out something that we're imagining, we're sort of getting a double hit of good things for the brain because we're getting the physical action and the mental lighting up of the brain with their imagination. Last one's kinesthetic learning. And that's a fascinating one because that's the way we learned and developed our brains since we were born. Tiny little babies, toddlers, youngsters, all the way up until we were teens, maybe even into our 20s, we were learning through physical activity. And we weren't studying or taking a course on how to ride a bicycle or throw a ball. We were just trying it and then seeing if we could do it. And the brain was observing us and helping us to be more efficient at that. Kinesthetic learning. So when we were little, or tiny even, we were not afraid to try new things. We were eager, we were filled with wonder, we were filled with imagination, like how would it be to throw a ball? I just saw my brother do that. Let's see if I can do it. Oh, how would it be to hop on one foot? I saw uh, the little boy next door hopping on one foot. I wonder if I can do that. And we're not afraid to take a risk, meaning we might look silly, we might fall down, we might, feel awkward or maybe even a little embarrassed. But when we're younger, we tend to be much more willing to attempt those things because somewhere in here, we know that we're not necessarily supposed to be able to do this. We're just learning how to do it. Then as we get older, we tend to not be willing to take risks. We want to do the things that we're good at, the things that we excel at doing. You know, we started playing tennis when we were 12 and we played tennis in high school and college and what? I'm a tennis player. But then the minute someone says, oh, uh, would you like to run a triathlon? We say, oh, no, I don't, I don't know anything about riding a bike or swimming. I'm, I'm a tennis player. So we're not as willing to take those risks, but taking those risks and doing something we don't know how to do or attempting to do something we don't know how to do or 
attempting to do something we know how to do differently. Those are the things that fire neurons. And that's why for many years they thought our brain didn't change because we weren't trying new things or not for a repeated amount of time. We might do it for five minutes and say, oh, I can't do that. I'm not going to do that anymore. As opposed to when we were children, I must have tied my shoe a thousand times or attempted to until I finally got it right. I wasn't going to get up give up on being able to tie my shoes, especially because my dad promised me 50 cents if I knew how to tie my shoes by the time he came home from work that day. So doing things that are new fires those neurons or brain cells. That's what we want to do. And we've learned from research that crossword puzzles, word games, taking a course, studying something does not delay cognitive decline because of what I just told you about those five functions of the brain. They all need to be stimulated and doing puzzles or word games makes you really good at those puzzles and word games, but it does not work all five functions of the brain. It stimulates two or maybe three. And so I like to use the brushing teeth analogy. If you only brush your front teeth for years, guess what? You're going to have issues with the rest of your teeth. And if you only work two functions of your brain, you're going to have issues with the other functions. So number one concern in the world right now about health by all ages is losing cognition or cognitive function as we live longer, as we age. It used to be heart disease or cancer. Those are still concerns and they're very, very valid concerns, but more than ever, 20s and 30s are seeing their grandparents have dementia, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. 50s and 60s are seeing their parents uh, with dementia or Alzheimer's. So we're very concerned about brain health. Now, in a world where we are not in control of a lot of things, I mentioned at the very beginning, this episode and the Living a Graceful Life show is about making choices that can help you live the life that you want to create. So movement is one of the choices you can make. There's no movement police telling you that you can't move, you can't exercise. There's no one telling you that you can't drink liquid as much as you possibly can. There's no one telling you that you can't sleep. It's choices that you need to make to help your sleep be better, to help your hydration be better, to help you have more oxygen about the way that you breathe, inhale and exhale. All of those are positive choices that you can make. I told you the story about myself in the last episode, having a spinal issue that caused a lot of pain. And I was told I'd be in a wheelchair by the time I was 40. I pretty much spent my entire life seeing what I could do to make myself be in such good shape that I wouldn't need to be in a wheelchair. And you can see that I was able to overcome that prediction. My mom was a brainiac. She studied, she learned, she did crossword puzzles and word games, but she didn't like to move. And ultimately she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. It's a tragic and horrible disease, but she was in charge of choices that she could have made if she had more information. So the good news is we have lots of information about how we can have a healthier, sharper, better brain. And in the end, that better brain gives us a better life quality. So I would just love to show you for just a couple minutes, a little bit of movement that you can do in a chair because being in a chair, being seated causes your brain to engage immediately. And it says, how would I do this if I'm sitting down? So we're gonna engage our brains. You don't have to leave where you are. You just sit right where you are. We're gonna put on music because music also stimulates the brain. And I'll show you a fun thing you can do on your own to help yourself have a better brain and a better life. This particular tool that we're going to use is called Team Fit. So it's about sports. So let's pretend that we're near a beach and we're going to surf. Put one foot in front of the other 
Whoa. So I'm on a surfboard with the cat. How about that? And you're balancing, you're riding the waves. And then you might even switch and put the other foot in front. Whoa. And of course you're using your imagination. You're using your analytical thinking because once the ride is over, what happens? We're gonna have to paddle back out on your surfboard. So paddle. Use your arms, use your legs, use your feet. Keep those feet off the floor. This is deep water. Now let's pretend we missed the wave. So we're gonna roll with the waves. Roll with the waves. And then when we get back to shore, we might say, well, enough of surfing. Let's play a little beach volleyball. Are you ready? And after playing a little volleyball, you might want to take a jog down the beach. So let's jog. Give it all you've got. You can even imagine you feel a little bit of sun's rays on your shoulders. That the is blowing through your hair while you're jogging. You can feel the sand under your bare feet. And then you might say, I'm finished jogging for the day. I think I'll ride my bicycle home from the beach. <laughs> So that's just a little bit of imagination and playfulness. Play is one of the things that stimulates the brain. Taking a risk, being a little silly, playing a game, using your imagination, that playfulness will help your brain stay young and sharp and fit and focused, and it will help your attention span too. So, I would just love to thank you all uh, for being here. But before I go, I'd like to tell you a tiny bit about how you can learn more about some of these tools. There are 21 of them that can help you have a better brain and a better life. Go to agelessgrace.com. And on there, there are handouts, there are blogs, there are video clips, so many free resources that you can use to help you have a better brain. There are also seminars that you can take online on Zoom that are also recorded. There are workshops uh, that you can take. There's even a 14 hour certification you can take if you would like to learn to teach this program to others. And as I said, the world concern that is number one that regards to health is losing cognitive function. So there are places all over the world in all 50 states and 36 other countries so far that are having people teach this program to them with the 21 different exercises or tools. There are so many resources on that agelessgrace.com website that I hope you'll visit it. Now, thank you so much for joining me for Living a Graceful Life. We'll be covering aspects of the mind, the body, the spirit, and the emotions. And I want to remind you that it's never too late to begin to make choices to create the life that you want to live. Thank you. And good night.